I am Doug Friedman. And I am Meredith Levy. And this is Your Mental Breakdown. The podcast. Hi, everyone. What's going on, Mare? Just living the life. Actually, I got my ears pierced the other day, and they hurt really badly. I'm like a four-year-old. I mean, I've had them pierced, but I got like third holes on each one, and they really hurt. Really? Like a little kid. They would, I mean, they're just in a line on your lobe. They're not up into the cartilage. No, right? hell no. No, I'm very sensy though. Oh. And so every time I get them <laughs> pierced, like one gets infected or something, not because I don't take Ugh. great care of them, but not infected, infected, sure. but they just hurt so bad that I just like end up taking it out. So we're going to try again. Is it sad that that just gave me a sense memory of being a teenager and getting my ears pierced and, and being able to like turn the studs, the piercing studs? That's what I have to do. And it would like get crusty and hurt and like, like gross. And then you put peroxide on it and that it bubbles is and you hear That is currently really what's loud. happening to me, but not yeah. quite that gross. Picturing you having your ears pierced now makes me laugh. I do have my ears pierced now. I don't wear earrings, but I have seven holes in my ears. Oh my Wow, that is a visual. Maybe you should put them all back in. <laughs> right. You know what I was thinking about? I'll tell you. Do tell. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but I often tell what's referred to as dad jokes. I have uh, mm. that kind of a sense of humor. Yeah, I feel, right? well, sounds a little familiar. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, stick around. You'll hear it. Okay. And I was just thinking like, I don't have kids. I was thinking like, well, maybe if I if I did have a kid, one of the endearing things or annoying, I don't know which, let me know, is when the kid starts to get older and starts telling the dad jokes back to me. Is that going to be like, hey, I'm so proud of my kid. They're telling the dad jokes or like, oh my gosh, is that what I sound like? Uh, <laughs> I was going to say for sure the first one, but now that you said that, maybe the latter. I'm not sure. <laughs> it could go both right? ways. I'm not sure. I mean, you're not sick of me yet. Obviously not. No. I mean, you're, I right. roll my eyes okay. every time you say, not every time. Like, <laughs> It's also shocking how smart I think you have to be to have the wit and comeback that you do. You can basically make a joke out of anything very like succinctly. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. I, I don't know if you have to be that quick. You just have to say the dumb things and not worry about it. I do that all the time. Yeah, me, all me the too, time. but in a different way, I think. <laughs> well, I'm aware that I'm saying them when I'm no. saying them. Maybe that's the difference. <laughs> Speaking of saying dumb things, uh, mm -hmm. wanted to let all you guys know that we are, <laughs> see, I'm going to switch up to serious. That's the problem with dad jokes and being yep. you know, so like me all the time is when yep. I actually get serious. Nobody takes me seriously. Mm -hmm. So seriously, we're cutting more of the sessions that you guys are going to hear lately. Um, and there's kind of two reasons for that. Uh, one is we're, we're trying to move the story along a little bit and let you guys in on what's going on with, with them and hoping that you get to hear more as we go. Uh, the other reason is more clinical and it's something where when you get to this point in somebody's therapy, I think we're like two years into Drew's therapy, we're getting to a place where what he's bringing in every week and what he's talking about every week isn't always right into the heart of the matter. Like we'll kind of chit chat. He takes his time, not any fault of his, but just getting into the meat of the story or, or, or getting into the meat of what he's dealing with, what we're working on. It's a circuitous route to get to the clinical stuff. So we're cutting a lot of that stuff out to just get to the more clinical stuff. And it might be like, I don't know, Merit, for you, like your type of client comes in and whatever they're bringing in, like the crisis of the week is kind of what you're talking about because you're constantly putting out fires with them. With somebody like Drew, he might be talking about, you know, oh, his manager at work is really difficult and this is what's happening. Or he just needs to vent something about somebody or, or some interaction. And it doesn't lead us to the thing for, you know, several minutes or, or several beats of the story that he's telling. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And it's funny with me and my clients, I mean, barring an extremely serious moment, so much of my conversations or sessions with clients are chit chat throughout, just depending on, on the client and the situations, which is why if we ever recorded my sessions and played them on here, it would just be 
it would not sound like yours. I'll Different. tell you that. Yes. <laughs> right. I will tell you right. that. You know, it's funny because as a therapist, and maybe this is some insight into how I work and how maybe other therapists work, I definitely allow the client to talk and, and let them say what they need to say. I'm listening with the ticker in my head of all the things that we're working on and all of the things that he's gone through in his past and where I know he wants to be in his future. So when he hits something that aligns with something on that ticker, I'll jump in and go, hey, you know, you were just talking about this thing. And remember that happened with this person and this person. And I'll reflect that to him so he can look at it and see it a certain way. So, you know, you and I talk about this where I'm more about the process, not the content. I don't want to hear the details of something. I'm interested in the the forest, not the trees. I, I want the bigger picture. I absolutely want them to tell me about every single tree. And I will reflect that to them too. But I'm seeing how it fits into the whole forest, you know? Yeah. My clients and I spend a lot of time, especially recently on the transition of my hair color, now that it's <laughs> right? it's gone from very dark to blonde. So... It'll yep. always be like, a, oh, wow, look at that. So, you know, got to throw that in there too. Right. And for me, doing something like that with a client might be, we talk about something and they're going to somehow back into something about when they made a change in their appearance and how people like commented on it, what it did to them. Then, okay, now we're off and running and we're talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just all about me in my session. <laughs> right, totally. Well, it, it's all about you and my session with Drew too. Um, but it's a lot of what we're cutting is the lead in, which like you're saying, and I don't agree with you that that's, well, that's all my sessions are. No, it's no, not. Of you're course actually it's not. doing no, really no, good no, work with No, 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 not at all. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Right, but. Right. but it was cool. This particular session, you guys will hear us. We start off with me reading a listener letter to him. He doesn't really listen to the podcast anymore, but he loves hearing the feedback and he loves knowing that he has an impact on people. So it was really cool to kind of reflect that to him. And you'll hear, I think we, we start off this session right with me reading this back to him. So you guys get to hear it too. Okay, well, let's listen. All right. Here you all go. We'll talk to you in a little bit. Bye. Bye. On a separate note, your podcast is world-class, and I really hope you take pride in the knowledge of how many people you and Drew are helping. I will keep recommending it to my friends and family. Thanks again. All the best from Dublin. That's cool. Ireland. Ireland? Dublin, Ireland. Oh, that's, I thought your name was Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dublin. Yo, yeah. what's up, Dublin? <laughs> what's Thanks happening? Thanks for props. <laughs> that's <laughs> Ireland. Wow. That's crazy. That's yeah, really man. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I love the reach. I think that's the coolest part. I think day one is what we were kind of talking about. We talked about it a little bit at the very end of our last session uh, of kind of what I was trying to do. I think you specifically have really inspired me and what I do and where I'm taking it and what I want to do with it and finding nice. what my meaning in the world is, you know, my purpose and, and what's the mm -hmm. point. One of the most meaningful transitions in my mind frame of what I think therapy is, is I've always thought it was like a weakness or like I, I said in the very beginning, an asterisk, you know, on my name of like not really wanting to talk to people about it and not wanting them to think that there's a weakness in there. Mm -hmm. I think this has really built me up to realize that it's like working out and bodybuilding. It's a completely different type of way to think about it, right? To be able to give back to the people that I think that I'm trying to make a mark on, it's been good so far. It's you feeling like you have purpose and you're being of service. That's big for you. You know, that, that means a lot. Leaving a mark and having an impact in a certain way, that seems to motivate you more. It's brought me back to the excitement factor of what I've been lacking in, in clothing. And it's been a fun kind of challenge to get back into the just being there authentically. And I'm busy as shit. Like, I'm busy as shit right now. But I don't feel overwhelmed and I don't feel overstretched. And I don't, you know, I feel like I found my groove again. And it's been a long three months. You know, it's been a very, very long three months. <laughs> to be here now, it feels really good. And, and I'm not taking away from the last three months because I think all of that needed to happen for me to kind of see a little clear. But I, f I feel really good about kind of everything going on. How you're talking reminds me of how you talk about mile markers, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just taking stock as you go. There's something that you're experiencing, which is the more authentic I am, the less taxing it is on me. 
and I told you about Maddox moments, picking your moments and not going a hundred or for you, 110% all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you're spent and you have nothing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's going at like 75% sometimes and that's okay. When it is authentically you. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm even transforming my 10% disappointment into maybe a 15, 20%. I don't want to call it withholding, but like my reserve and knowing that when I kind of hit that E, I still got a little more to go. Um, But just being kind of a little bit more mindful of where I'm at on my spectrum. And that's definitely helped me to be able to, uh, I just want to stop and smell the roses. And uh, I think that's really, it's happening. It's just kind of, I'm living and enjoying and going day to day, which has been, it's just been fun. The other cool part is I feel I'm, I'm doing what I want to be doing. And I have the people around me that want to do it with me, but still are doing their thing. Yeah, I love that. What you just described is interdependence. Mm -hmm. I'm not codependent. I'm not dependent on them. They're not dependent on me. We can rely on each other, but we're not dependent on each other. Sounds so different than when you used to be like, no, I want to do it with my dad. I want to do it with this. We're really looking for that. Yeah. And now it's okay. You've taken to the analogies so well. They're fun for me, you know? But there's something about it that you really embody. Like, I mean, you you are being the Green Beret. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean you're not going to be prepared and be Boy Scouts sometimes. You, you are. You know how to do that too. And that's the spectrum. And, and you're finding where you are on that spectrum. And it's easier when I'm just being myself, not trying to please everybody else and do so much for them and give to them, you know? And you can do that with your time and your energy, which if you remember, I said, those are the only two commodities you really control. Exactly. Your authenticity is at the core of that. Right. And that's there. Yeah. And it always has been. It's been nice to feel stronger in my boundaries and not feel like an asshole. I've kind of realized that what I'm doing for myself selfishly in a non-bad way, you know, um, has really allowed me to find where my boundaries are fit in and finding the right way to have the conversations and the don'ts. Those have always scared me and, and freaked me out and been like, ah, I just would rather not have the conversation. Right. You know? Especially when they would be 10% disappointed and that wasn't okay. Yeah. Before the holidays where on the one hand you were talking about not going home and how that was going with mom, you know, and her like guilting you and then like, well, calling me up and then saying, Are you, that's guilting me. Like, you know, you had that with her. But the really telling one was wanting to like hang with girlfriend and friend called. Mm-hmm. I was like, hey, do you want to hang? And you were like, yeah. Oh, wait, hang on. No. Yeah. Because I want to spend time with my girl. I haven't seen her all week. Yeah. And it was a trip for you at the time. Do you remember that? At the time for you, it was like, it was weird saying no to my boy. Yeah. And letting him down, right? Mm -hmm. And then later you realize like, oh, wait, he just wanted to hang with me. Right. And it was okay to say no. Yeah. Because I was saying yes over here. Fast forward to now, you've had some experience of what it's like giving somebody your boundary and having it be okay. If they're disappointed, if they're not, like that's on them. You know where you are. To me, I think that's a pretty fragile thing in my life because I don't get that very often. The part I want to work on still in all of this and in these types of relationships is not worrying. I just feel through time and time again that I've been burned, you know, in relations. And so I almost want to separate all my relations so they don't intermingle that issue of unresolved. I don't want to say anger, jealousy, animosity might be the right one. And that's going back to my 10% disappointment of wanting to figure it out or just kind of steering clear. We talked about this in terms of the trauma response. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Of how you're in that fight, flight, fawn, or freeze mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's something about you being hypervigilant and so guarded against somebody doing you dirty Mm -hmm. that you're almost looking for it. You know, literally sometimes looking through their phone. Yeah. Right. Yeah, literally. Yeah. yeah. Because we're so focused on that. That's our focus. Mm-hmm. I think you're surrounding yourself. This isn't the right phrase for it, but people that are doing you clean. Those are the ones that you want to surround yourself with. Well, and I, I say it, doing me right. There you go. Especially because for you and not just being a good Christian, but righteousness matters to you. Mm-hmm. Right. The right thing. 
and you have a sense of your right and wrong, of your morals, of your integrity, and right. your values, your authenticity, all of that. So the more you do that, great. That's what you're bringing around. A group, a gathering, an inner circle of people that do you right. If they do you dirty, mm -hmm. like friend did, mm -hmm. bye. Yeah. And it's funny because he hit me up the other day. It was yesterday, maybe the day before. And so uh, mm -hmm. me now, you know, I'm cool with where that left. And I don't feel, I don't lose sleep over it. I don't feel anxious about it. I don't feel like there's a pit in my stomach of like, oh, I feel guilty. I didn't do enough for him. And I still want to help him in some way or another. I don't know for me right now if that makes sense. Going back to my moral compass of what I think is right and wrong, I always want to help people. And I don't really care too much if they've done me, done me right or done me dirty. I still want to help them, you know? And so I think for me right now is navigating what it looks like to have an appropriate relationship with him and not dive back down the rabbit hole of opening the floodgates for him and giving him all of my relationships and everything like that and being okay with his disappointment as the relationships progressed. If, if I do 20% of what I was doing, he's gonna be mad disappointed in that, but I'm gonna feel good about it because I'm still doing what I think is right. I think solidifying that for me has also helped with me and my parents' relationship and what their, I'm air quoting disappointment with them because I don't mm -hmm. think they're really disappointed in me. I think they get disappointed in situations. Like I talked to you about hospital bill, right? I got slapped with that one. I'm still trying to figure that out. She definitely is passive aggressive in the sense of like, like today she was like, yeah. And like, just so you know, you still have that bill. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know. And then that led to the, and what about your rent? And so it's like, usually when one thing gets brought up, it snowballs into this bigger conversation. I feel like I'm 18 again, learning all of this, you right. know, and, and I think my banding got ripped off really slow in that aspect of my life. I still feel like a kid trying to figure out my finances, but I'm getting a lot better at it. Like I, I can already yeah. see it and I can feel it. You're getting there. You're moving towards that. I'm very good at letting people into my inner circle. And then as soon as they do one thing, it's like, oh, you're out. You're the next one. And you do another one. Oh, you're the next one. You're the next one. I think inherently, going back into my mom, you know, she's done me really dirty in a lot of different ways. And what I realized with her and my relationship is that, yeah, there's been some weird times and some fucked up shit happened. And she's made some really bad choices. And I've made some really bad choices. And it's just life. And, and I think... Across the board, 100% of the time, there's never been love lacking, you know, and I think I was really loved, sometimes not the way I needed to be, um, but there was never mm -hmm. a lack of love. It's just trying to find out my boundaries and where I fit in. I mean, I did it with a girlfriend and she fucked me over, you know, and, and kind of was like, okay, well, this is my worst nightmare. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen to me. Let's see what happens, you know, and I... I genuinely have never had a relationship the way I have with somebody with her today. You know, I just flat out, I have never had it. And I don't think, I mean, I, do I wish it never happened? Yeah, of course. But am I somewhat glad it happened too? Yeah. So I can kind of get out of the way and be like, okay, now let's, where do we fit in together? And if we just don't, then okay, that's okay too. And what I'm trying to say in that is going back to the very start of this is how, uh, independent I'm feeling right now that it, it genuinely is okay I'm not even okay I'm good I mean, I'm in a really good place and I'd be happy you know if if we still had a relationship and I'd be happy if we didn't as we're talking about it the people that have done me really right and done me really dirty you know what I mean I mean my mom's done me really really right in a lot of ways like major like like 95 percent and there's like a 5% where it's eh, maybe, okay, I'm going to go with like 75, 25. I'm going to break that one up a little bit different. But she, she's a little different because her doing you dirty was she's doing herself, herself dirty. dirty. Yeah. Right. And so I'm just like a side effect, you know? And so as I've navigated each one kind of differently, I've kind of tested the waters and I feel like I got like a body armor on now, you know, to where it's like, I can take a couple of hits. I can take a couple of bruises and like, I get to decide what's okay and what's not. I hear it as not body armor. I think there's something more powerful than that, that you're experiencing. It's love. Mm -hmm. And it's something you used to say like, yeah, I need to go home to get love done. 
right? Mm-hmm. And even like, oh, friend just wants to hang. Oh, I'm sick and he came over. Why? He loves you. The love is there. The change has come internally for you where I'm no longer dependent, codependent on them in the sense that I don't need to do whatever I need to do, whatever it takes in order to feel loved and show love Mm -hmm. and compromise myself. No, I won't do that because I can be myself and have boundaries and still be loved and show love. The headlines for today is my time and energy. Where do I put it? Mm -hmm. Now that I don't have to just give it away in order to feel that love or have them feel love, where is it truly okay with me? Mm -hmm. And saying no is okay. This is cool. Like, it feels good. This is fun. And that's new for me. Yeah, it, it's, it's been really cool, too, because way back, you know, it was like wanting to buy a friend and stuff. Yeah. I'm like, what? Wait, no. And, and you, you know, you, you calibrated that and you found it and you got it. Like, cool. And then it was, oh, yeah, let me go out of my way to be there with him. To hang with, oh, wait, no, I don't have to do that either. Mm-hmm. Huh, okay. So you're realizing it's not about that. Right. It, it's about that, that true connection and attachment that you have with each other. Yeah. And it's positive. You know, that it's, it's healthy. You're experiencing more healthy attachments in your life yeah. that are interdependent, still rooted in, you know, for you, the righteousness, like doing me right, not doing me dirty. And I can have my boundaries. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't have to be there all the time. Sacrificing, compromising, not being me. It's really experiencing you the way you want to be. And then they're okay with it or they're not. Good balance for you yeah. in that. And finding where on the spectrum you are. You've left the, the extremes. Yeah. And you're finding, you know, the more center place where you're just kind of oscillating a little bit. Yeah. And I feel a lot more solid than what that is too. I can see it happening. That You know, I just see it happening. I'm pretty excited for that. I'm back into my routine. And it feels really good. And I'm understanding relationships a little bit better. Little mile markers. I love them. And we're back. We are back. It made me laugh so hard when you were like, from Ireland. (laughs) And he was like, oh. And then you were like, yeah, I can't believe the reach it has or whatever. And he's like, oh, I thought you meant it was like from a girl named Ireland, which I totally could have seen Dublin. either way. Yeah. Dublin. Yeah. yeah. Was, totally, oh, Dublin. Totally. Her like, name was Dublin. No, no. Her name was not Dublin. Oh, her name she was Ireland. was from Dublin. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. I got it right the first time. Her name could have been Dublin too. <laughs> Mayor, was, you are part Irish. You've been there. I am. Dublin is I haven't is in been Ireland, there. I haven't been right? there. Not yet. I thought you were um, going there. In my mind. Wasn't that your big plan? You were going to Ireland? In my mind. Oh, I think it was. In my mind, I'm going to Carolina. <laughs> oh, that's a James oh, Taylor lyric. So if you're 40 joke. years old or more, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was really sweet though, how he was super touched by that. And but rightfully so, I think. And I think it was him that said a meaningful transition of his mindset of therapy, how he used to think it was like a weakness. And now it's basically the total yep. opposite. Yep which was awesome to hear. I'm glad to hear that coming from him. And also, I feel like in general, hopefully, that that's more of the mindset of the general public at large, just, you know, that mental health is being so much more accepted and obviously not everywhere and more and more, hopefully it will. But it was good to hear him. I love how he talks about it in these ways. Like, yeah, I'm I'm coming around to therapy is not about when you have a weakness and I want people to hear this. And I, he, he talks about therapy is like the same way I go to the gym. Like I'm, I'm getting personal training for my brain and my emotions. And yeah, I I do wish a lot more people thought that way. That's kind of why we're doing this. That sort of led into giving back and him having a purpose. Yep. And then I believe he said he found, he's finding his groove again, or he found his groove again, which I thought was very cute. (laughs) Well, and remember, if you guys have been listening, you know, we're we're back with Drew on the main podcast. If you haven't been listening, he's been on the Patreon for a while, but all those episodes are back on 
the regular podcast. So if you're listening to this, you can go back and hear a lot of Drew if you missed out. But he has been in a depressive episode pretty much for the last three months. And this was him starting to feel like he's coming out of it. And that's something that I loved him talking about, not just because he's coming out of it, but because he's recognizing he's feeling more authentic and it's easier to be himself being authentic. And that there's just something about how he's describing things now. And we'll get into it. It's not necessarily that the things around him have changed, but he's internally feeling a little different. So coming out of kind of that, that gray or that blue period and, and seeing things a little differently now, it's pretty cool. He said something about being selfish. I think he said in a non bad way or something like that. And I, you know, I don't know. Selfish has such a negative connotation, but don't you have a little phrase? What's your thing for selfish? I don't know if I have a phrase for it, but I say selfish isn't a bad thing. It's thinking about yourself. Oh, that's it. Thinking about yourself. There you go. I knew you had a something. And that, that works for some people, not for narcissists and, and people that are constantly thinking about themselves. They can be a little more selfless. And you're right. He did say, like, you know, I'm doing this for me selfishly, not, not in a bad way. And he said, it's what's allowed me to find my boundaries. And I think for him, he was describing like having these conversations when he's, as he said, down in the dumps. That always scared him and freaked him out. And he just didn't want to have the conversation because he didn't want people feeling bad or, or something like that. And it was always external. And now he's like, oh, you know what? I can just think about myself. I want to have these conversations. Here's what's going on for me. Or I'm not having it with you. It was cool because I got to recall for him what seemed selfish, but was really not. It's selfish in the way you and I are talking about it now, Mare. When one of his best friends called him and wanted to hang out and he was like, yeah, you know what? I can't. I'm going to hang with my girlfriend because this is like the first day off I've gotten and I want to spend it with her. Right. And he wasn't worried about alienating or abandoning that friend. He, he was a little worried because it was one of the first times he did it. But the friend was like, yeah, that's cool. I'm going to go take a nap. Right. Like no big deal. So it's something we've been working on for a long time. That idea of you can be selfish, not in a bad way and put yourself first, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, like in an airplane, and right. take care of your needs. And he's starting to do that, which is really cool. Yeah, and even acknowledge that he's now okay with people being disappointed in him. Right, that's a line that he loved from way back, saying like, they're 10% disappointment in me. It's cool, because it, it is opening that up a little more and giving him more room to just be where he is. He's like, well, if they're going to be disappointed 10% or whatever it is, fine. I'm going to have my boundaries and take care of me. Right. Great. And that's something that, again, we've been working on for so long. An interesting parallel because with Sarah, we were talking about something similar, that superpower thing that they have. And for Drew, that idea of not putting on the cape all the time and not going out there and doing so much for everybody else all the time that burns him out, and can you take care of yourself? And he's just starting to kind of live that. And that's, I mean, <laughs> something I thought you would pick up in here was uh, the idea of people doing him dirty, right? Yeah, of course. You're like, oh, doing you clean? He's like, doing me right. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, yeah that's better. <laughs> Surrounding himself with people who like do him right and everyone else, you're just like, bye. Yes, obviously, to right, some extent, right. like your parents are your parents. And obviously, you can always set a boundary and peace out from them too, depending on the situation. But it's definitely, you can't pick your family type thing. No, we got who we got. Right. But at one point, he said he still wants to help people that have done him dirty. And I'm like, what the fuck? It, you know, then he started talking about his mom. I guess the question is, like, Obviously, you didn't go into specific detail. I would have been like, help how? What do you mean? Who? Why? Um, but I was just like, hmm, okay. Well, it depends, I guess, on what he means by help. But I was sort of like, okay. You know, he talks about like his good Christian values and, and being a good person and, and really wanting to help people out. I think where that actually comes from is a fear of abandonment mm -hmm. and fear of judgment. And that's why I talked about the fight, flight, freeze, fawn. He'll fawn. He'll try to make it okay with everybody, you know, people pleasing, make sure they're all right. And he would also, like he said, 
lose sleep over it and feel anxious about it and have that pit in his stomach and feel guilty and, and go down that rabbit hole. And he's doing less of that, which is cool. Him recognizing though, like, yeah, I still want to help people that do me dirty. Right. He's not ready to give that up. Yeah. We're just calibrating it. We're trying it differently. And, and, and we're seeing like, right, when you have boundaries and you don't feel guilty, what's that like? And if you have boundaries and you do feel guilty, what is that like? You right. know, as opposed to, oh no, I just shouldn't have boundaries. We're, we're really leaning into the idea of independence and interdependence, which is very cool for him. Yeah. I loved how he sort of said, yeah, the people around me that, you know, we do things together and then they're also going and doing your own thing. You're like, yeah, the opposite of codependence. <laughs> right. Was totally. Awesome. totally. And it, it's, it, it was even cool. Like that, that moment, you know, you and I, Mary just joked about like his mom doing herself dirty. He and I said that in stereo, which was cool, you know, cause he has held for a long time that she's doing him dirty. And it's not okay because he's trying to be a good son, doing so much, and he and, and he's like constantly let down by her. And hearing him say this in stereo with me was like amazing. For me as the therapist, I'm thinking, wow, this is the recognition that he doesn't have to take it personally. He's a separate person from his mom. She is doing this to herself, and he sees that. Yeah. And he even said he's feeling independent and feeling good. Yeah. And even talking about his finances with his referring to his finances and how he's really trying not to talk about it with his parents very much. And sometimes it's sort of like the rebellious teenager phase where he's almost trying to be too independent mm -hmm. and doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And yeah. You know, him having some financial troubles and having, you know, issues with his heart and, and that kind of thing. It's tough because he's navigating being independent for probably one of the first real times in his life, legitimately. I got to say, as his therapist, I don't know how you guys feel listening, but I'm so proud of him hearing this. And it's, you know, a lot of what this session was is to use his phrase, it, it was a mile marker. And sometimes sessions are like, hey, you've reached this mile marker. Let me reflect it back to you so you can see where you are and you can see how far you've come from where you used to be. Part of the journey of going through it with them is, is this. It's we have the, the ability to keep an objective perspective and, and still be in it with them, but we can stop and go, hey, let, let's, let's take a look at where we are and where we've come. Check that out. And it's really, you know, going through the, the stages of development with them because they haven't done it before. You and I were talking about interde interdependence, independence, and individuation from parents. I've done this with hundreds of, of teens and adults. Some of them have never done it themselves before at all. Drew's never done it. I've done it with people hundreds of times. So it's really cool to hear him get to this point and for me as a therapist, I am not jaded. I hear somebody like Drew going through this. I am so excited for them. And I know you're the same way. Like you, you are the biggest cheerleader for your clients. Totally. Also, he's so young. I know you and I had very different experiences. You were independent since you were a teenager. And I was not right, at right. all <laughs> for a long time. No, you just so, got cut off, what, like a few months ago? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> 49 Let's see, so yeah, like 47. Oh, right. They <laughs> said when you turn 50, they're finally cutting you off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think he's young. I mean, what? His frontal lobe basically just finished forming. So that expectation of ourselves and him, I mean, again, no acknowledging strengths and weaknesses. Okay. So, you know, he's super independent and super adult in some ways and not at all in other ways. And that's just life. And that's how it is forever. Whatever you want to call it, quote unquote adult. But I definitely still don't adult in many ways, which is <laughs> well, fine. You know, you talked about his frontal lobe finally forming and he's being affected by that. I think your lobe has started forming an infection with the pierce that you just put into it. <laughs> Fuck you. So maybe soon when that how heals, you... you will become an adult too. Once again, once again, how, how it's amazing. Just tying it all together in a neat little bow so we can wrap up for you while you put some peroxide on your ear. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect.
And on that note, <laughs> why don't you guys all tend to your lobes and we will be here for your lobing pleasure next week with more. Make sure you can hear with those lobes. See, I almost had it, but I lost I know. it. But I'll yeah. find it. Come back yeah. next week. I'll have it again. You will find it. You will find it. <laughs> That's right. And we will be back with Sarah next week because we're switching off between Sarah and Drew. So if you don't want to hear Sarah, we'll see you in two weeks. If you do, check it out. You should listen Obviously. anyway. Yeah. It's good. It's yeah. us. Listen even if you don't want to. We're going to tell you new and exciting things that you wouldn't Suck hear otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note. Bye. Bye. Bye.